On behalf of the Black Community Development Project, I would like to welcome you all to the Communities Against Racism Conference, the first of its kind in this area. The conference is being he held here in Greater Pilton, not because racism exists in Pilton any more than anywhere else, but because the project and this community want to set an example to other parts of the city as they have done before. is an excellent example of how well an organisation will work if it is set up and managed locally, as it were, if it is grown in, in, the, the, grown in the local ground, as it were, and if it's owned by the local people who themselves set it up and continue to run it. We know in the council that that's the way things work best. This project has developed through the joint action to tackle racism in the area by the Muir House Anti-Racism Campaign, they call that Mark, and the Pilton Community Education Team. In the autumn of 1995, the project was awarded a four-year urban aid grant, and so it became an independent body owned by the local people. It enjoys very strong support both from the local white community and also from the black and ethnic minority community in the area. And that, together with the commitment of its own staff, has been its strength. Because what we are trying to do is to create good working relationships between neighbours and fellow citizens, and also to work for fair dues for all. We see ourselves as anti-racist project, not a multicultural project. We make sure that our people empower themselves and we make sure that they don't miss because of lack of information or because of lack of anything. They don't, sort of, they are not going to miss that opportunity. Uh, we run um, a successful Open Sunday group and a black women's group in the project. Uh, that is a Sunday group. It brings all isolated black and native minority in the area to come together and to share their experience and to support each other. There was a fringe meeting at the Conservative Party conference at which Mr. Tebbett, who is, who is as unreconstructed as ever, was speaking, and again you may all have heard about it. He was worried about the multicultural nature of British society, worried, and I'm quoting, that different cultures will splinter our society. This is supposed to be an upbeat year, an upbeat time, European Year Against Racism, 1997. Um, it's new times, we've got a new government, Scottish Parliament, um, lots of good news around. Even Scotland and England qualified for the World Cup this year. Things, things are supposed to look good. They've started calling Britain Cool Britannia. Have you heard that one? You know, like, <laughs> times are good in Britain. And what I want to say is the reality is quite different when you start looking at racism. And in actual fact, these are very difficult times. And 1997 is a particularly difficult year. Article 2 of the European Convention of Human Rights uh, says that everyone has the right to life, that's a <coughs> fundamental human right. And what the Article 2 does is to say that this shall be protected by law. Refugees are people fleeing persecution. They are fleeing the threat to their lives. And if anybody, refugees are the group of people that governments and people should be protecting because that is about the essential of human rights. The discussion of refugees is not about global humanitarian issues of protection and the right to life, but is shot through with bigotry and racism. Here we have a group of people who for centuries have faced discrimination. They are poor, um, many are illiterate, being badly housed, with, very, um, with infant mortality rates which are very high. Michael O'Brien, the Minister for Immigration, said, 
Changes needed to be made to the immigration system, which has been criticized for being too slack. This characterizes the United Kingdom response to refugees for the last 15 years. They are represented as a problem, portrayed as being illegal economic migrants likely to abuse the system. Asylum seekers flee human rights violations. They do, do not come as a choice. They live in a precarious situation, unable to return home, but also unable to find effective protection against being forcibly returned. Imagine you are living in a country where you face the possibility of persecution. What would you do? What would you take? How would you leave them? your family? What are the choices you have? How do you get the papers that are necessary for you to come here? Over the last few years, you've seen anti-fascism come back again to the fore. Um, there have been some large anti-fascist mobilisations. The BNP have started to put themselves forward in elections and whatever. All of which is fine, but don't forget there was also a decade called the 80s. The um, first speaker mentioned the fact that going back to like late 70s, you had some really good anti-fascist demonstrations um, of, the, of, the, of the type she spoke about. But in the 80s, they all disappeared because fascism was seen to have gone away. But it didn't go away for us. It went away in terms of electorally, but some of us are still getting beaten up on the streets by fascists, so it hadn't gone away. But for us as black people, it's, it's an ongoing issue that we have to be conscious of. We shouldn't separate out. If you look at most anti-fascist mobilizations, they're nearly always white. And I'm saying particularly to black people, we have to get involved in anti-fascism as well. You've got to work in partnership with anti-fascist campaigns, but what you don't do is let people take up the reins for you. People who see um, racism as merely a subsidiary of anti-fascism, for me, have got it the wrong way around. So we as black people have to be looking at fascism as part of racism, keeping this together, and not allowing those that occasionally jump on a fascist bandwagon to then be the vanguard of that struggle. I think the question to ask is, are our actions effective enough? Sometimes we fall into a way of doing things and you don't change, you think, well, this is the way to do things. It's drawn from the 70s and then sometimes in the 90s it's not necessarily the same way of doing things. So we also have to look at ourselves and think, how are we operating? Because the bottom line about this society is, it actually oppresses some white people just as much as it oppresses black people. And so there are some links to be made. And I think if you can't make those links, you're never gonna move forward. So, particularly in an area like Scotland, I think that's the way we should be thinking about it. Focusing on race, but then also making links with other struggles. And you'll notice, they didn't assassinate Martin Luther King or Malcolm X until they start to make those links. Why are black people underrepresented in the workplace and overrepresented in the job centres? And is the gap of people living below the poverty line widening or shrinking? I think the answer is widening. Government figures show that ethnic minority groups are overrepresented in the lowest income groups. The latest PSI report notes that this is particularly true for Pakistani, Bangladeshi and Black Caribbean households. The IRS, the Industrial Relations Service, has noted that proportionately more ethnic minority employees are earning low pay than white employees. One in five full-time Pakistani and Bangladeshi employees earns less than three pounds an hour. Poverty and discrimination are closely related. In fact, it's sometimes very difficult to separate them and to separate which is cause and which is the result. They are both deadly. Now, over the last 18 years, poverty has become increasingly personalized. Poverty is a problem of the poor. So we have concepts like the underclass. The underclass is a name for groups of people the Victorians used to call the undeserving poor, poor people with attitude. That is, poor people whose poverty is generally felt to be self-inflicted. One of the defining features of poverty is a lack of choice. People stay in poverty because they have no other option. Employers are missing out on the black communities as a resource, and there is no positive action to recruit black students so that they can be then trained to go on for employment. There's no accountability from large training organizations, for example, like LEAL, uh, as, to what, as to their strategies for training black and ethnic minority communities. There's lack of understanding of black needs with regard to employment and training. Black ethnic minority communities have to become politicized and made aware of the Scottish Parliament as an opportunity to have their issues addressed. A strong voice will be needed within the new Parliament to ensure that resources are directed towards black community to, and to address their issues. Thank you.